other room, but due to technical no. difficulties and easier reading the computer oh. here than in the other room, we're going to be a little bit snugger here. So we did not plan on it, but we are here. <laughs> but we're rolling with the punches. <laughs> And our own Faith Campbell is our presenter today with a program about the women in Maine during the Civil War. And she says she's got things that happened because of their actions during the Civil War that led to other things. So I think you'll enjoy the program. Well, first off, thank you very much. Um, I am Faith Campbell, and uh, I'm gonna, I've given my apologies to some of you as I came in this morning as talking about things not going the way you planned. Is I've been working on this presentation, and, and, and I knew I would be doing a lot of printing this week, so early this week I went to Bangor, and I purposely picked up a, back, uh, uh, a backup ink cartridge for my printer. Well, this morning I'm printing out my final copy, and sure enough, the old cartridge is petering out. I said, no problem. I'll put in the new cartridge. Well, darn if I couldn't get the thing to print. And my son is at work today who usually solves my technical problems. So I, I, I regret that I'm going to be reading off a screen to you as opposed to the written copy that I can just kind of look at and come on up. So I do want to say that here. So this project is actually, uh, has, more, has more since it began. Originally, it was to be given in the summer of 2020 for the state's bicentennial. And of course, we went into pandemic. And then a few other things uh, intervened, which was gave me a little more time to research and to the point where I said, there's more than one presentation here. Mm -hmm. So there are things I'm going to touch upon. You're going to say, why didn't you go more into this? And I said, and, and I'm just saving those for other papers, and, and including one that um, includes a, um, a slide a slideshow with some music on it. So hopefully we'll be able, I'll be able to present that as well soon. Um, I do have a few books up here that I, just to give you an idea of some of the resources I, um, I'm, I consulted. Um, Confederates Down East, some of you may know that there was Confederate action off the coast of Maine uh, during the Civil War. For the Stockton Springs Historical Society, Without any irreverence, our Bible, <laughs> the story of Stockton Springs, or maybe the, we can call it the New Testament of Stockton Springs, as opposed to Faustina Hitchhorn's Old Testament of Stockton Springs, which was sketches of Stockton Springs. Um, some of you um, also, we, I have, uh, uh, up until 1857, the town that we know as Stockton Jews. Springs now was part of the town of Prospect. It's another great resource here. And do we have do I have anyone here from Searsport? Searsport, yeah, a couple of people here from Searsport. Well, I think many of us who study local history have referred to this book too, Searsport Seas, Sea Capsules. Okay. Um, so, uh, does anyone have any questions before we start, or any particular issues you might want me to address when it comes to addressing? Um, Maine women, how Maine, Stockton, Maine women and the surrounding areas confront the Civil War? Anything? Good. Okay. Well, good. We'll start. Go on and I'll, and I'll start reading here. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to try to, I'm going to sit. All right. And I, it's been a couple of years since I've done a public presentation, so you let me know if you can hear me or not. Okay? So, so I'll just start right here. So, let's begin. Stockton Springs was incorporated as a state of Maine municipality in 1857. Four years later, Confederate forces fired upon a federal garrison at Fort Sumter, marking the official beginning of the United States Civil War. Some might reason that such a new municipality might not have had the resources to support effective home front contributions to the war effort. While it is true that the municipality's status was new, there is much evidence that it had a well-established business community along with religious institutions and social organization network. Thank you, Sarah. These factors were instrumental in helping Stockton confront and meet Civil War-related challenges its, citizens, its residents encountered. 
This presentation attempts to summarize the effort of the community's female population. In doing so, we find that women in surrounding Maine communities are likewise engaged. Faustina Hitchpoint sketches of Stockton Springs and Alice V. Ellis's The Story of Stockton Springs, 1955, and The History of Prospect, Maine, 1980, provide examples of these businesses, religious, and social organizations. The 1863 diary entries of a 16-year-old Searsport re resident, Emma W. Pendleton, provide primary source documentation of a young woman's daily life during perhaps the most uh, tumultuous year of the, uh, of the war, 1863. Emma, Emma frequently mentions Stockton businesses, events, and people in her diary. She has numerous relatives and friends who reside in town. I need to speak up? Okay. Okay. Emma was the daughter. Okay, I'll try this. Emma was the daughter of Captain John Park Pendleton, who died at sea when Emma was an infant, leaving her mother Amanda Shelburne Pendleton to raise six children. Emma's er, Emma's diary has been transcribed and preserved through the efforts of the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport. What women have done: May, women's wartime work and post-war activism from 1860 to 1875, authored by Lisa Rue published in Maine History, details Maine Civil War uh, activity and its effects on the continuation of temperance and suffrage later in the century. Ryan Swartz's three Republican Journal articles on Belfast's and Sarah Monroe Parker's Civil War activities provide an example of the multifaceted roles Mid-Coast women played during the war. These three articles were written as part of Belfast's Civil War sesquicentennial commemoration. These publications and papers were extensively used in the writing of this paper. Other cite sources will be cited throughout the text. So first, I want to talk about the economic climate <coughs> of Stockton and the surrounding area. Okay, so if you came to Stockton at the beginning of the Civil War, what would you have seen? Four-year-old Stockton Springs as a town. Miss Hitchborn and Mrs. Ellich provide us with impressive details about Stockton business community. Such details include the information that 47 vessels were built in Sandy Point section between the years 1820 and 1867. Nine of these vessels were built by a Calcord Mudgard and Company between 1857 and 1868. Mr. N.G. Hitchborn and various associates bit built 42 vessels between 1846 and 1874. When, when Mr. Hitchborn was state treasurer from 1865 to 1869, the daily operation of his shipbuilding interests was transferred to John Littlefield. Further records indicate that there were 66 builders and building companies in Stockton from the mid to late 19th century. Many of these buildings had shipping interests in numerous towns including Searsport, Belfast, and Prospect. And if I knew if we had some, I was going to have some people here from Bucksport, I would have thrown that in too. Okay? <laughs> the shipyards were accompanied by associated businesses such as sail lofts, blacksmith shops, coopers, rope, uh, rope walks, chandlers, etc. It may come as a surprise, but many women had economic interests in the shipping industry, ranging from breadwinner paychecks, ownership shares, marriage, and other family connections and dividends. The war put these ships, crews, and cargo in danger of being intercepted by Confederate Navy, the Confederate Navy and privateers. There were several local women and children whose lives were put in jeopardy when their husband or father's commands were threatened by Confederate ships. Directly confronted or not, the threat was there and must have been a terrible strain. Confederates down east is an excellent reference to these threats faced by New England coastal communities and merchant shipping here. And for some of you in the audience may not know that it was, um, I'll, I'll stay sitting, I'm sorry about the screen, um, may, may not know that um, from the mid-1800s to the about 1900s, it was quite common for a merchant captain's wife and children to go along on these voyages, whether they were short runs down the, the coastal routes or all the way to, to Asia and back here. So there were, so again, we, this is all comes in the milieu of what I, we could consider mid-coast Maine because so many of these wives and children were at sea with, with their fathers during this period of time. 
Other Stockton businesses include a variety of retail shops. There were several dry goods stores. Jane Lambeth had a women's clothing store and millinery business. Shortly after the world, Mrs. La uh, war, Mrs. Lamberth and her son built the Lamberth Building. E.M. Ellis ran a fancy goods store. Searsport's Lucy Edwards had a woman's clothing store. Her store, now Lucy's store in Searsport, had a telegraph connection to inform people of the latest news from the war front as well as information about local shipping interests. The Stockton Savings Bank was given the Maine State Legislature authorization to operate beginning in 1868. Prior to that time, many Stockton merchants did their business at the Searsport Savings Banks. Stockton, resi Stockton resident state <coughs> treasurer, N.G. Hitchborn, was one of the bank's board of directors. That's a, another director was Captain William McGilvery of Searsport, who was married to N.G.'s sister, Harriet. N.G.'s, uh, N.G. Hitchborn's daughter, Harriet, who was an accomplished ph photographer, was named after her father's sister. 16-year-old Emma W. Pendleton of Searsport Oh, oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. 16-year-old Emma Pendleton of Searsport several times mentions in her 1863 diary of coming to Stockton specifically to purchase items such as fabrics, clothing, footwear, household items, and even her algebra textbook. <laughs> and I, I, this the diary of Emma, I, I, it goes on for several pages, and it is worth, worthy of a presentation in itself. It is just a wonderful resource at the Penobscot Marine Museum. <coughs> and I, I mentioned her algebra textbook because Emma several times mentions her desire to qualify to take the national mathematics course in high school. And so when she passes the, 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 the test that enables her to take this course, she's over the moon. And and throughout the year, she says how hard it is, but she's going to keep at it. That was a source of pride for her to qualify for this, take this higher level mathematics course, which I, I kind of wonder if it had something to do with the fact that her father and her father and her, actually the entire Pendleton family and her extended family throughout Searsport were, and, and Stockton were into the maritime trades because it was quite uh, often that the reason why children went with their parents on these voyages was to train, train the next generation, and a, and a major part of that was navigation, for which you, need, which you needed the advanced mathematics. So this was, you know, I wonder if that was a kind of a role. She will go on to marry, um, a, as an adult, Cap, um, uh, Captain James M. Blanchard of Searsport. Well, neither Miss Hitchborn or Mrs. Ellis directly mentions cottage industries or small-scale small -scale agricultural enterprises, it is safe to assume that they existed and women played a significant role in their operation. It is hoped that some aspiring young historian, and I see some in here, <laughs> may find in a dusty archive bo box more evidence of these contributions. It would be understandable that many women did not have time to keep daily diaries, especially during the war. However, letters were written. The problem is that letters were usually sent outside the community. So if you want to find a letter from a woman from Stockton Springs, most likely you're going to find it in Grinnell, Iowa, or something like that. <laughs> you know, so that's always a challenge here. Yet, the war's outbreak did bring new economic op opportunities and challenges to area women. The need for war supplies, such as tents, clothes, tools, etc., combined with male enlistments, expanded the factory work opportunities for women. Many made women had been heavily engaged in textile factory work since the 1830s. The Winterport Clothing Factory of Messrs. Gilbert Curtis and Sam Dillonany put out a, uh, repeated calls for women workers during the war, stressing mm -hmm. the need for coat makers, for military coats, and soldiers' drawers. And I got that from Waldo at War, which is a Republican Journal article of January 2014 by Ron Javella. And I found that in the archive box of the, uh, one of the archive, archival boxes at the Belfast Historical Society. And if any of you are interested in the Civil War and you have not checked out the resources, gone to the archive boxes of the um, 
Belfast Historical Society, I encourage you to do so. They are a treasure. Well, that same article cites that soldiers pay compared to day uh, labor wages was an early inducement to enlist, whereas the average 1861 monthly wage was $6 a week for a common laborer, and uh, excuse me, $6 a month for a common laborer and $15 a month for a skilled laborer such as blacksmiths and carpenters, soldiers' pay was advertised as $13 to $21 a month with $100 on discharge. Well, many young men felt that the <coughs> war would not, the, that the war would be short work and they would be <coughs> home for the harvest. You know? <coughs> they just believed that they were going to go and beat the Confederacy. Well, we know that wasn't true. This misconception left the burdens of daily life squarely on women's shoulders, coupled with double-digit inflation on items such as the staples of flour, sugar, coffee, lard, etc. On Mr. A.S. Frederick, an address given in Belfast in the year 1917, recounted his experiences as a young man, cites flour ranging from $15 to $20 a barrel, and hay at $40 a ton. Emma wrote on November 5th, 1863 in her diary, this morning Mary and I went to Stockton. I purchased a dress and a pair of boots. Everything is very high. Yeah. So she's writing it at that time, so she knows. A current Maine State uh, Museum exhibit includes information that an average soldier's monthly pay could not support a family, which caused an increase in many town poor rolls, in addition to the increasing number of war widows and orphans. In Emma's 28, September 28th entry, she writes, Henry Howe was married last Saturday to Mrs. Olive Eaton. Her husband died out south about a year ago. So now we see widows remarrying. So, yeah, so there's a whole other aspect to women's life here. In 1862, the people of Stockton voted to give relief to families of men serving as soldiers. Congress passed a Conscription Act in 1863, prompting the town of Stockton to pay $300 to any drafted resident to offset the potential financial hardship. Stockton's established business community must have been a factor in the town's ability to provide for these relief services. And they were. Many surrounding communities engaged in similar efforts. Belfast women formed the Ladies Volunteer Aid Society, and I'll refer to that from my <coughs> now on as the LVAS, Ladies Volunteer Aid Society, to assist the noble men of our city and vicinity who volunteer to defend our country in its, in its, this hour of its greatest peril. <laughs> A quote, <laughs> okay, Brian Schwartz, quote. Realizing that recruitment was denying many homes of a breadwinner, the women, the women resolved to assist families of such men as deprived of their natural protectors. And we'll, we'll explore some more of these women's organizations later in the presentation here. But with all of this going on, you can just imagine that people were what we would call today stressed out, you know, have this incredible emotional toll. And again, we're going to back to 16-year-old Emma. It appears that the war was taking a heavy emotional toll in 1863. Emma writes on July 3rd, tomorrow is the 4th of July, and this 4th will find the country in such lamentable condition. It would be, it would be several days before the community would learn of Union successes captured, Union successes at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. The July 6 entry states, news came today that folks had captured Lee and his whole army. I hope it is so. Well, we may have dented the Confederacy during the, uh, at Gettysburg, but we didn't catch the whole army. Too bad it wasn't so. The next day, she writes, news came that Vicksburg is taken. I hope that it is so, but we cannot tell. They had a great time in Searsport, ringing the bells, firing the cannon, etc. All right, so again, getting, getting news from the battlefront was a mixed blessing. Oh. 
An interesting photograph of a New York Mercury newspaper subscription purchased in 1864 by Stockton resident Francis Shea Fry was found on the main memory network site. Now, why would a woman in Stockton subscribe to a New York City newspaper? Anyone want to take a guess? Why would this woman sitting in Stockton Springs want to subscribe to a newspaper from New York City? Family. 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 Yeah. Well, the, yeah, your genealogy, yeah. Well, I kind of muse a little bit because I said she might have been a tremendous baseball fan as the newspaper has been accredited with an early promotion of our national pastime. <laughs> it really was, you know, he was. Yet, I suspect she was more interested in the regularly published soldier dispatches from the battlefield. The newspaper publishers encouraged soldiers to submit stories from their experiences. These might be considered the modern day equivalent to a chat room, you know, getting news right from the front here. Now, at one time in my life, I was a newspaper reporter. <laughs> and so, I, so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about, well, this works out pretty good for that publisher. Here he gets all this free, <laughs> pr all this free print, right? Right? You know, all these soldiers writing in, you know, he doesn't have to pay reporters or anything like that. And then people will buy the newspaper because they want to hear the stories. <laughs> you know, but that's just me, you know, kind of thing here. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, back to Emmer's entries uh, include information that there was a month, uh, a month's, a month's outbreak, and at times up to one third of the school was absent during the last weeks before July, July summer vacation. And later in the fall, she mentions typhoid cases. There's quite a few typhoid cases in our, in our areas. Um, and again, she's living in Searsport. Actually, she's li not only living in Searsport, she lives in the Park Fendleton District, which is our, you know, just down, like two miles down the road from here, down where, near where Debbie lives there, right? So typhoid cases. In November, Emma's mother was quite ill, and her older sister had to take charge of the cooking. Her mother, uh, uh, Amanda Shelburne Pendleton, died on June 1, 1865. It is unclear if her death was related to this illness, but no doubt raising six children in this period was a terrible strain. These diseases required many women to add enhanced health care uh, enhanced healthcare provider and household and financial duties to their daily tasks. Conflicts are not only on the battlefields. Okay, and we don't, don't always have a united front. And Charlie, I'm going to mention, uh, just to kind of uh, give you a little bit of a heads up, Mr. Smith here, I'm going to be talking about the Copperhead meetings here in Stockton. Charlie, I'm going to be talking about the Copperhead meetings here in Stockton. They had some here? According to Emma, they did. I knew they did from Prospect. Oh, well. Yeah, well, they had one here, too. Okay. Okay. September 10th, okay, 1863, okay. On September 10, Emma writes, this evening I have been up to Stockton to a Copperhead meeting, as they call it. It was just such talk that I like. Well, I read that and I went, holy camoli, that's a big thing here. Now, what does anyone besides Charlie know what a Copperhead is in Civil War parlance? It's Copperheads, no one? No, okay, Copperhead. Copperhead was a negative term for a group that was largely made up of Democrats who wished for a negotiated peace with the Confederacy. They are sometimes called the Peace Democrats and were opposed to continuing the war for the sake of the abolition of slavery. And it is these Peace Democrats, aka Copperheads, that ran um, General George McCullen in the 1864 presidential election against Lincoln. Okay. And the year 1863 was really, uh, had a lot, of, was tumultuous to say the least. The year 1863 saw the enactment of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War Military Draft Act. We can only speculate what prompted Emma to find so uplifting at this meeting. Was it a youthful hope that all could be decided peacefully or was two and a half years of war related daily hardship taking its toll. It must be remembered that the war had particularly heavy tolls on shipbuilding and merchant, merchant interests, which were the bulk words of the coastal economy. 
Evidently, Emma found the meeting so meaningful that the next day her entry includes, I forgot to write that yesterday was my 16th birthday. So she's going home after this Copperhead meeting, writing in her diary, and she forgets to mention it is her 16th birthday. Now, for many girls, that 16th birthday was a big deal. But they see evidently these copperheads were something. So just the, and again, they're just the way she writes it. And it's just the talk that I like. So, you know, not everyone was, you know, sometimes in retrospect, we see things a little bit differently. Well, these primary, this, what, this di diary is a primary document really kind of gives us another viewpoint here. Now. Some audience members may have heard of a Confederate attempt to seize Callis, Maine, including <coughs> robbing the bank to obtain funds for the Confederate cause. So how many of you have heard about the attempt to capture Callis, Maine? Yes, it is, right? Confederates down east. There are no, numerous uh, uh, attempts along the coast of Maine. I'd just like to read a little bit about this here. Um, this, the mission's leader was, um, the mission's leader was um, Confederate, Confederate States of American, America, the Confederate Naval Captain William Collins. Captain Collins had family in St. John, New Brunswick. It was during to this visit that his sister Mary learned of his plans. She immediately contacted her brother, the Reverend John Collins, who immediately left his York, Maine congregation to intervene. William was staying with Mary, but was not at home when John arrived. And she said to John, he's out with desperate, desperate men, and I'm terrified. Mary was able to show her, her brother John a map and other incriminating papers. John immediately went to local authorities who notified the, Cal the Callis authorities who were able to apprehend Captain Collins and his associates in the act of robbing the bank. Only, one can only imagine the angst Mary must have felt. You know. she, see, Mary was, was, so, was so concerned about her brother and she was hoping that if her other brother came, the minister, he could talk some sense into him. And um, it, it just didn't happen. And so finally, the Brother John goes to the authorities in St. John, who contact the authorities in Callis. And so the one thing that reason why Collins was not going in, he, and actually by this time, after being a, um, Collins was part of, um, let's just say, the Confederate equivalent to our secret service or, or spy, um, he, was waiting, he was waiting for a ship. He was waiting for a ship with some other, with, with backup and support and for, for the getaway type of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what gave a little bit of time there. It was about a six week period. Carlins and his associates are captured at the bank. Um, you know, they, they went to the bank with, their, you know, with guns out and actually the uh, local authorities were already in the bank and we met them face to face with some guns and, and thankfully no one was hurt. But uh, Collins and his associates had been in Callis for a while, did put up a flag and, you know, did some basic things, but it was the idea of they wanted to get him robbing the bank as a way of <coughs> being able to hold him. And, and Collins was arrested, he escaped, they caught him again, and then he was eventually paroled at the end of the war in 1866 here. But again, very close to us here. Uh, social organizations, and this is where women shine here. Boy, I'll tell you, the social organizations here. Now, social organizations, you're going to hear a lot about things like church organizations or women's groups getting together here. So we have so, in the immediate area, we see some really nice uh, ways of looking um, at this. Like, for example, um, in Sandy Point, they already had a women's, a ladies' aid society. And so when the war broke out, they were, all, they were all ready to go. But because of their concerns of with some fun, the way the funding was done, so there were some funds received, that the group did break into two, one specifically to take care of the soldiers' concerns and one to take care of the general community concerns here. In Belfast, you have a number of women groups who kind of come together to form the, um, the ladies' volunteer um, society. 
as well here. And in, in Stockton, it's, it's uh, pretty much the same way here. But going, looking a little more closely at the social organization, despite the war's disruption on economic life, Maine women contributed to an estimated $15 million to soldier AIDS projects. Yeah, that's, that's from the U.S. Sanitary Commission, Charlie. One, abol one abolitionist organization known as the Daughters of Freedom raised $10,000 in, in one theatrical and dinner event held at Bangor's Norum Baker Hall in February 1863. Mm. It is not a far reach to conclude that many of those contributing time, talent, and materials were doing so when their loved ones were serving and their own finances were under strain. These organizations were productive from the start, but were thwarted by unpreparedness of the early military transportation distribution networks. In early 1862, Private Charles <coughs> Maddox wrote his, to his mother that although her women's group contributions <coughs> got through to his local unit, most of it had been destroyed or spoiled in the transport. He, he stated that the ladies should just send their donations directly to the unit as the military system was seen as not being up to the job. The next year, he wrote that the United States Sanitation Commission had much improved the system of getting necessary supplies to Maine soldiers. The commission was a federal agency that worked in conjunction with civilians who helped the military fill in the gaps on providing for soldiers' well-beings. Its efforts helped to build assurance that civilian donations made it to the soldiers. Its efforts tremendously encouraged the formation of, of numerous soldiers' aid societies throughout the Union. Private Maddox might also have been pleased by the arrival of Hamden, Maine native Superintendent of Nurses Dorothea Dix, who is credited with the greatly improving overall battlefield nursing care. Ms. Dix had studied battlefield nursing under the world-renowned Clara Barton. In addition to her national role, Ms. Dix contribute, contributed to the founding and successful operation of the Bangor Soldiers Rest Home. Local women volunteered as nurses and provided care for 28,000 soldiers during 1864 and 1865. The Sanitation Commission attempted to provide some relief for, human, human, for, for Union soldiers in Confederate prisoner of war camps including the efforts of Augusta, Maine native Mary Livermore to help those in Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. However, relief came too late for Stockton native Walter, excuse me, Warren F. Griffin, who was in prison at Libby and returned home an invalid. Griffin had been captured as a result of the first Bull Run in 1861 when there were few, if any, resources available for soldiers in both the Union and Confederate military. A little bit more now on the local ladies' aid societies. Ms. Hitchborn and Mrs. Ellis detail the efforts of several local organizations which were used to provide soldiers' aid through the United States Sanitation Commission and the Maine Soldiers' Relief Agency, which was formed to coordinate the flow of home front goods to Maine soldiers. Ms. Hitchborn's sketches of 1908 concentrate on the efforts of what we call today downtown Stockton. She cites the Soldiers Aid Society was formed on February 5th, 1863. Ms. Horksborn provides a membership list for approximately 50 members. She also details the organization's constitution which is similar to several other local societies. The society agreed to meet on Thursday at Cleves Hall to supplement the soldiers bedding, clothing, and foodstuffs. In addition, money was collected for the soldiers' benefit. The Cleves family donated the use of the building, and it is interesting to note that it was a temperance building, which made no drinking allowed. So we had some temperance go work going on here in, St in Stockton. I suspect that, th that it was the close association between the temperance and abolition groups that encouraged the Cleves to work closely with the Soldiers' Aid Society perhaps more so since the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. The Stockton Group mailed at least five large shipments of goods and over $800 in cash. The last shipment was sent in April 1865. Even though the last shipment was sent after the end of the war, the goods and cash were no doubt put to good use aiding hospitalized soldiers, 
soldiers not yet discharged, and those traveling home. Mrs. Ellis's work detailed the creation of the Prospect Ladies Charitable Society in 1849 in Sandy Point. The meetings were held at the brick schoolhouse or individual homes. In 1859, the group purchased a sewing machine. In 1861, a separate group of this organization was formed for the soldiers' benefits. This group sent at least two boxes of clothing to the Soldiers' Aid Association. The Belfast women were successful in providing clothing for their local soldiers as well. Their first meeting was April 27, 1861 about two weeks after the firing of Fort Sumter. It met with 78 members just two weeks after the firing. By May 4th, 1861, they had produced 107 pairs of blue jeans, 140 handkerchiefs, and 140 traveling cases, plus $24.25 in cash. The ladies received a letter from Maine Governor Israel Washburn thanking them for their contribution to the 4th Maine on, on May 5th but regretted to inform them that the soldiers were to have specific uniforms. He promised to send them bales of wood to make shirts. The LVAS received a bale of wood, wool flannel from the state on May 11th and cut the flannel into shirts the next day. Another bale arrived on May 17th and within a week the Belfast women had produced 372 flannel shirts to the 4th Main Camp in Rockland. Along with the article they had previously made before receipt of Governor Washburn's letter. See, these women were out there even before the, you know, the, the governor was able to get to them of what's happening. They just decided they were going to make all this stuff for their men, and that was it. You know? So they were, they were the head of the curve. And even though he said that they, they, the soldiers couldn't use, you know, shouldn't be having that stuff, couldn't use it, they, 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 you know, they after doing what they, was requested of them, they still sent the stuff anyway. So there, right here. Well, yeah, that's right, okay. Now, the, this, there was a wonderful woman who was the president of this organization here, and, that, and this, I'm gonna spend some time, just a little bit of time speaking about her, so, because her, her, her contribution was tremendous. The president of the Belfast LVAS was Anne Sarah Monroe Parker, who belonged to a noted abolitionist family. It is reported that her brother's home on the corner of Main and Market Street was a stop on the Underground Railroad, and that's in Belfast. The Fugitive Slave Act, enacted in 1850, required under penalty of fine and or imprisonment the reporting of any suspected escaped slave caused, caused a gro growth of Maine anti-slavery societies. In the period of, from November 1853 to November 1854 alone, more than 50 new female anti-slavery societies with over 2,000 members were created in Maine and the numbers continue to grow. Okay. So what happens with a few, some of you may remember from your high school history class that the Fugitive Slave Act required that people, that people even if they lived in um, states that did not have slavery were required under penalty of law, under penalty of law, with both fines and or imprisonment, to report any suspected person of, we'll say, we'll say today, person of color, did not report them to the authorities here. And that, and that kind of brought it home, it kind of brought it home. Because when you're up here, and you're, in, you know, and you're, you're living your life, and you know slavery's going on, and you're saying, well, man, that's too bad, or whatever. And, but that's down south. This Fugitive Slave Act brought it here, right here. And so then you start seeing this growth of people taking more an active role, yeah. and it was a good part, the, many good parts of the women. In March 1863, Anne joined her physician husband, Dr. Dyron Parker, at the 20th Maine Camp and several others in the area near the Rappahannock River in eastern Virginia. During this time, she would send word back as to the condition of Maine soldiers and evidence of the effectiveness of the donations to their general welfare. She had access to the Army of, the, the Army of Potomac Hospitals aided by her physician husband. She, 
she cites death despite excellent medical care and wrote to and wrote her and she herself wrote to grieving mothers words such as their sons had many comforts far from home and with strangers to make an easy dying bed she advised her local uh, women's group the LVAS that clothing was in was not in short supply. And now this is March 1863, so we're kind of getting to springtime. She says, clothing, don't, you know, let, show the clothing is not in short supply, but it would be best to send food for the sick, okay, food for the sick, and acids. Send meat, canned chicken for broths, lamb, mutton, veal, put it into airtight containers, and send scurvy inhibiting foods such as tomatoes, cranberries, pickles, chopped cabbage. Wow, so you know, just kind of working on there he said, now. So I, I'm good here. I, I looked at that clock and I said, oh no. <laughs> okay, and so yeah, I've, I've had 45 minutes. I'm like, I'm really rushing here. And so, and so gentle audience, I have written and oh, I'm almost finished. She, she as Sarah, you know, um, uh, as Mrs. Uh, Parker may have uh, wrote, so it was done. So I, so I have written, and I've, now I'm almost finished here. I just want to thank you for your time and patience. Uh, this presentation's length is a testament to women's many roles in confronting civil war challenges. I would like to. Uh, I, I've attempted to give a good, uh, to give a broad overview of local women's various activities during this, uh, this critical time period in, of U.S. history. I would like to add that I'm, I'm further research, researching the Daughters of Freedom, the, organiza the, the organization which raised over $10,000 at Norenbega Hall in that one evening. This abolition group concentrated their efforts on the plight of female slaves, which somewhat helped quiet male voices that stated women had no business in the political arena. However, these daughters helped lead the way into the women's suffrage movement. One of the most ardent groups opposing women's suffrage were brewers and distillers <laughs> who were concerned that the women voters would approve the prohibition of alcohol as suffrage suffragettes tended to have strong ties with, with the temperance leagues. Um, I'm going to be happy to answer any questions uh, to the best of my ability and comments. And But with that last thought about the women's vote, Read this book. If you're interested in Maine Women's and Suffrage, this is a great book called Voting Down the Rose. And it's, uh, it's sub, you know, with the continued on Florence Brooks White House and Maine's Fights for Women's Suffrage. Now, with a disclaimer, the author of this book, Anne Gass, is a great granddaughter of Flor uh, Florence Brooks White House. But this not only talk. Maine women played an incredible role on the not only here in Maine but on the national stage when it came to women's suffrage, and there are two there are um, two factions in that. There were some work some women working for suffrage, going for each and every state, like making it a, it a, a, a state law for everyone, and others that were making it one of the, the entire amendment, but you know like a, the Nineteenth Amendment. And a lot of times, these two groups did not get along, did not see eye to eye. And what's really amazing is that the leaders of both of these groups are Maine women, <laughs> two <laughs> Maine women. <laughs> so again, you know, you get the women going here in Maine, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but, but actions here. So does anyone have any questions or comments or would like me to go on to anything further? Would anyone like to volunteer one thing they learned today? Maine women are tough. <laughs> we know that, don't we? Yeah, I know. You mentioned the house in Sandy Point, a brick house. Is that still there? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know which brick house they're but, talking but it about. Is, it is Sandy Point. It, it, according to the Ladies' Age Society notes, and according to um, Mrs. Ellis, you know, who got who got their information from the notes? There was a brick she house. She was drunk, probably. Well, you know, <laughs> the other thing is the other thing is is that place and locations and where they can sort of change here. Mm -hmm. Like there are s some brick houses 
or remnants of brick houses up along the blanket laying closer to where we would say like 174. So that might have also have been considered like the brick or stone houses here. Um, the only, because the only brick house I can think of in Sandy Point right now would be what the building had was what you at one time was a library right next to the community hall. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, but that that house was built much later. Hmm. That house was built much later. So. Wait, uh, which yeah. one, the Red Gables? Uh, yeah. Well, yes, the 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 library. Davian's, Davian's house. Davian that I got. Yeah. Yeah. How about Red Gables? Is that right? I, I I don't even, I don't think you mean Redgate. Redgate. Red, yeah, Redgate. Mm. I, I I believe I believe that was a frame that it was, was. A frame, it was a frame house. Yeah, it was, was a frame, frame house. house. Right. right. Yeah, okay. and it's you know it because um, but I, I I wish I had known. I, I asked I've asked several people. I even asked your brother. You know I shouldn't say I even asked your brother Mac, but I mean <laughs> Mac no Mac knows you know a great deal about things yeah, like that. Mac's done some research on Redgate. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I believe is on opposite sides of the road. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Right. It was kind of like across from Bob Robinson's house, the old Flint Rock Forge, and somewhat across from, well, the, at Greystones, your mother's house, Max's yeah. house, you know, there too. Because the road has changed, so it's really hard, it's really hard to picture where that might have been. Yeah. I wonder if it was one of the houses that had brick in the walls because that's the way they were built when we were still fighting the British. Like the old manse right. has brick interior. Mm -hmm. And and there was and the blacks had a, mm -hmm. uh, had a house uh, down by the old manse there. Um, that for those of you, that's near the intersection where you go to the Sandy Point Beach down there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah okay. That's what. That's the reason we're we're talking about there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Searsport Historical has a presentation on September 12th. Family history of Phineas Pendleton's granddaughter mm -hmm. and Penny's grandmother, Penny McGowan, is right. her son. So I don't know if that's your Emily or well, uh, very close. So Phineas Pendleton had a brother Green. Mm -hmm. Phineas Pendleton the first had a brother Green Pendleton. Emma is Green Pendleton's granddaughter. Okay, so it would be like a great great uncle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There yes. might be something there anyway. Yo, no, yeah. thank you for the information. Yeah, yeah there sure is. September 12th. Oh, I'll get that. Um, yes. Were there any women soldiers who went up and fought? You know, we have, there are, there are reports of women soldiers throughout, you know, throughout history. I'm not sure if there are any here um, from Maine or this section of Maine. Charlie, do you know that? Any female soldiers from Maine? My understanding is the only women who slipped detect uh, it was only women who slipped by detection mm -hmm. and were discovered when they were hospitalized. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or dead. Yeah, or dead. Or dead, right, yeah. yeah um. But but as a primary enlistment, that did not happen. They weren't allowed to fight? No, correct. that is correct. At that time. At that time. That's the way it was. Like a man. Mm -hmm. They dressed like a man? Actually, yeah, they yeah. were. Yeah. 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 Women, women were not part of this conscription act. Of course, what that meant is they were here having to do all, you know, all the other the tasks here and taking care of the home front, which was considerable. You know, whether it was in their own homes or in factories or volunteering, in many cases, of those 20, uh, we talked about the Bangor Soldiers Home and the treatment of 28,000 soldiers within a two year period. Many of, the, many of the women who are nursing there were doing so as volunteers. Yeah. They also serve who sit and wait. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, sometimes the officers' wives would go down, like for the particularly the winter camping. You know, the winter camps when the activity was low. But yes, yes, Debbie. Do you know if 
do we have any records of um, soldiers that are actually from Maine, but if you were on a sailing ship and you were in the harbor in the Confederate area, they would actually make you join the Confederates? I have a grandfather. Mm -hmm. My great grandfather was wounded on in battle at the same time as my other great grandfather on opposite side. Mm -hmm. And wow. he was he was on a ship and he was like in Louisiana and they made they said they could pull them in and make them serve. Is well that, they you know they, much about that? Well they, they not much, they, I've heard of it. Yeah, that's about it. Because it, Debbie, it's wartime mm -hmm. and you're you know, you're on a ship and you're in enemy war you might be in enemy waters. Or, you know, so it's like you and a few guys, and you might have a whole crew on another ship. <laughs> you know, the odds are about you successfully getting away and, and acting in defiance. It's not going to work out for you. You know, no, I mean, it's you're just going to have to. It's, it's like, it's yeah. conscript. It's like being, um, it's conscript. That's what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was at least one ship from Searsport that was regularly <coughs> going down to uh, South Carolina. Um, the McGilvery's had connections down there, they, and this area had been sending lumber down there. It was a town that was founded by Bucks from Bucksport. Mm -hmm. And that one ship, there may have been others, but I've only read of the one, would go down and it would stop at a port and get Confederate papers. So it could go into the Confederate ports and it would be legal. And then when it came back north, headed for Searsport, it made a stop and it would get its union papers. Wow. So it could come legally up the coast. Wow. And it kept doing that a number of times. Is that yeah. the one that was captured? No, no. It was a uh, Staples that lost the ship. Yes, that was Captain Everett Staples, the one who built the house below me. Um, and that ship was burned and sunk. Yeah, okay. And then uh, Captain Partridge, uh, his ship was captured. And after a short time, it was given back to him. Probably Masonic connection. Well, I was just going to mention. I was just. Gonna, I was going. I was going to mention that because there is, there are several, um, several, merchant captains from this area, who came across Confederate vessels on the high seas, and it was this when it was decided when they each of the captains learned that they were members of the Masonic lodges. They just kind of shook hands and went their separate ways. You know, that was it, you know, that type of thing. But again, um, there was, you know, it was not always easy if you were a woman aboard the ship. I can think of one case in Searsport, uh, of a, a, a Searsport family where the their cargo ship was, um, in, uh, was captured, if you will, by a, a Confederate naval vessel and was boarded and they questioned the crew and the wife and, you know, took, you know, took cargo and possession of the vessel and all that. And the wife was just, came back and she was just infuriated because the captain of the Confederate ship said, which was, had written an article for a Confederate newspaper and talking about the episode and and, he, and she was upset because he said, can you imagine what he said? He said that I was a woman of a fair face and a fine figure. Who is he to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that scoundrel. You know. I can take a much worse thing. <laughs> well, anyway, I, but at the same time, I'm thinking about what is going through her mind because here they are, they're in the ocean. You know, they've got a naval vessel, they're a merchant vessel, you're in the middle of the ocean, you got, you know, granted, you got, your husband's got a crew on his ship, you've got, you've got your husband and his crew, but the other guys are, are, are sailors, I mean, and, and armed sailors, you know, and it's like, and you know, 
anything could happen, and who would know? You know, mm-hmm. and that. So you got to kind of think of that way. Maybe she was kind of voicing her her <coughs> angst in that. <coughs> Maybe she <laughs> just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that she got a compliment. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I don't know. Well, she might have considered that. Uh, that was being way too forward mm. yes. at that time yeah, yeah, for yes. someone who did not know her, and especially since it was someone who was from the opposite side. <laughs> you just didn't say a lot of things back then that we think nothing of now. Really, really. Well, you mentioned that Copperhead meeting. Yeah. I, did you mention the Cleavage family connection with that? I did not. Do you have information on that? No, no, I thought I just heard No, that. no, I no. I was wondering if, if that meeting was held, you know. She does not mention the location of the meeting, just that it was in Stockton. <coughs> just that it was in Stockton, September 10th, 1863. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quite, uh, oh, go ahead, Ralph. You, uh, you mentioned Warren Griffin. Was that Captain Jones, one of his brothers? Was that one of Captain Joe Griffin's brothers? Captain Joe Griffin's brother? Griffin's bro- <laughs> not that, I don't. I, I'm not that familiar with the okay. gene, genealogy of the Griffin family. I'm sorry, Ralph. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we could look. We could now. But now you know it. You know, we could I perhaps look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Okay. No, Ralph's the culmination of the genealogy. <laughs> 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 no, no. <laughs> You mentioned Green Pendleton. I always get him mixed up with Sylvester Brown Pendleton. Oh I yes, think, I, 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 I think Green's in there somewhere. And there are two. Actually, there are two Green Pendletons. Yeah. There's father it's and funny. son. There's father and son. I come down from Sylvester Brown. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Got a cu- couple quick stories. Uh, okay. There's a Captain Hanold monument mm-hmm. up at Mount Prospect. Mm-hmm. And I always thought it was attractive, and I liked the name Pano, and that's all I knew about it. But he was drafted and bought a substitute, and I'm very thankful for that, as I'm sure a bunch of Germans were, because he had it. He was uh, he loaded a ship and headed away from New York, and saw a. Confederate privateer had stopped at a ship, which he later determined yeah. was loaded with, I think, about a hundred Germans, and they were about to set fire to that ship with the people on board. Oh, and he bought, he surrendered to the Confederates. He bonded his ship to them, in other words, a written promise to pay in the future, to buy back his own ship, and was allowed to take all of the uh, passengers onto his ship, which put him dangerously Mm -hmm. low in the water, being loaded and adding all that weight, and made it back to New York, and the headlines were unbelievable. He was quite a hero. The other story is I went to a Masonic meeting in Union for the first time a few weeks ago, and having 30 minutes to kill, stopped in Appleton and photographed some Civil War graves. And one of them was a crab tree. Uh, poor guy uh, joined what I recall was the 4th Maine in Rockland, which would make sense, Mm -hmm. they're very close. And he was in the field, there was no skirmish going on, but he had to stow his weapon in order to, let's say, have dinner. He went to hang it in a tree and shot himself. Oh, no. Oh, it's horrible. And died. Mm -hmm. And he was a well-known Masonic member, and the Masonic members of the 4th Maine put all their money together and had him embalmed and shipped back to Appleton for burial in his wow. home cemetery. Wow. Very unusual, most mm-hmm. enlisted are buried where they die. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ralph, I just, just you say the name, Piano, P-A-N-N-O. Mm-hmm. I've never really heard that. I have a, phone, a 
uh, uh, someone by that name in my family photo album, but I have no idea where the name came from. I didn't know it was panel. Yeah. A yeah, I don't know where it came from. Okay. I know well, where it ended up. Well, <laughs> actually, one of Langworthy Lampford's daughters married a Pano. Okay. Yeah, somewhere where I have had a photo of the house with him. Yeah, it was right across, down on, got it in the, on the cape, in the, just past uh, the... Yeah, just around the corner. Yeah, second. Just from the second. town garage now. <laughs> Why? Yeah, the why. Okay. Let's see now. Who do I have here? Pace, Pace. Boy. No, it's it's not him. Uh, there is in Searsport, there is a there is a um, there is a reference to a panel at the Penobscot Marine Museum. But I don't have I don't have him he's not listed as a Searsport captain, but now that I think of it I believe it was. It, it was a middle. It was a middle name. It was some mm -hmm. someone panel. Someone. It's yeah. possible one of the Lamphers, Lamphere captains. It could be. Since it was Catherine Lamphor who married uh -huh. uh, the first panel here, Maybe. and they had probably seven or eight children. I don't, I don't see it here, but it might come. For some reason, I thought it was, I thought it was a staples, but well, we can look that up later. Yes. Uh -huh. um, did anyone else learn something today or something tickle their fancy? <laughs> yes. I learned you can raise $10,000 in one night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In 18, yeah. In yeah. 1864, yeah, it is. It's just amazing. It was. And it was kind of, it was like a, a gala, you know, it was like a, and when you think about, it was in Bangor, and you know, the, they were in quite an active lumbering community, and a little bit of, of worth, you know, net worth at that period of time there, but it certainly was, <coughs> was, t certainly took an effort. Do you have any idea what that $10,000 would be in terms of today's? I have looked at, <laughs> I've tried to look, I get various calcula, you know, I get various calculations here, but at least it would have been at least like um, $100,000 if not closer to $250,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, twenty five. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's, you're right, that's conservative here. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the gold uh, back. Too. What? She come up with a, but you mentioned the, the Masonic connection and mm -hmm. respecting the other that leads credence, I believe that, because it leads credence, that story goes back to the revolution with George Washington, of course, famous Mason. Mm -hmm. And he, Washington had good reputations in general on getting his, retreating, not getting, not wasting troops. Right. <laughs> and I think the real reason was, what I heard was that, of course, the British officers are all also Masons. They have to work hard a few times not to capture them. Uh, really? <laughs> uh -huh. wow. I've heard that too. Yeah. 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 Mm. So let's all become Masons. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, uh, the females aren't allowed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they change that. This program, though, brings up a couple other areas that would make good programs. Yes. Uh, the temperance movement in this area. N.G. Hitchman ran on temperance. Um, S.I. Roberts was a big temperance man, and there were others. Uh, the abolitionist movement and the number of people from this area who settled the abolitionist town in the Midwest. Oh, in Grinnell. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. um, yes. Um, actually, about 20 years ago, the former minister of the Searsport Congregationalist Church, Ar uh, Arlen Larson, wrote a yeah. three article series in the Congregationalist that detailed what was it, 54 or 56 individuals from this It was locality. over 40. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was. Um, um, actually, I've got those because he <laughs> yeah. also did a senior college course right. on right. that. Yeah, and he was very generous and shared those articles yeah. with me. And, and it was something. And you know, um, a lot of times, you know, um, it was interesting because people of many different faiths would go to these communities. It was mm -hmm. not all the time things, but in particularly um, Unitarians 
would go. Uh, Unitarians were um, very um, active. Unitarian members seemed to be very active in abolition. And then, uh, we were just generally talking about abolition, but then you have the free, working in the Freeman bureaus af af yeah. afterwards as well is, is something that we see kind of a continuation on here <coughs> too. So very interesting, exciting. Maybe, yeah, that, excuse me, Unitarians, was that political? That was a church. Oh, a church. it still is. Mm -hmm. well, well, yeah, actually, yes, now I have yeah. to say it. Yeah. 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 So, the, so, for example, up here, the Church on the Hill, Congregational mm -hmm. Church, was founded in, what, 1853 as a Unitarian church. The Sandy Point Community Hall originally was built as a Unitarian church. <coughs> but we have to see, when I listen to certain yeah. mentions like that, that these were all little departments of themselves, like like a political party. Maybe not political, but if they had an opinion, they obviously came out together. And, am uh, I correct? The Unitarian Church is considered to be the most liberal of the Christian churches. So the others would go against that. Right? And most of the Unitarian churches along the coast were started by a majority of sea captains and their families, which also says a little bit of something about the sea captains. Uh -huh. um, they insisted for the most part on having Sunday services, but on board ship when they were at sea, but it was more of a service that could be non-denominational rather than I see. Baptist or Congregationalist okay. or something. So it didn't matter really what you were. <laughs> right. And, yeah. it's, and it's still this way too. There's a, for example, there's a Unitarian church in, in Belfast and, you know, and, and many surrounding communities here. But the, the little Harbor Church near well, Sears Sears Island, near yeah. Sears Island, originally that was the first Congregationalist church of Searsport. That was the, where it was first established in 1815. When the second church, very shortly after the second Congregationalist church was built in what we now call downtown Searsport, mm -hmm. oh, that yes. church, that the smaller church was a Unitarian church mm -hmm. before going back about a hundred and well about seventy-five years afterwards uh, to be part of the Congregationalist. Is church. that what it is today? Today, it, it's I don't know the exact ownership of the building, but it is being used by a. Um, more of a Pentecostal, full-spirited yeah. mission church of a larger church up in the Bangor Brewer area here. A lot of us thought when the Universalist and Unitarian joined, it was kind of watered it down with one of them now. Well, yes. I refer people to the uh, Alexander Staples diary from the 1850s where he wrote down, he went to church twice a day on Sunday and came back and wrote the verse down the preacher preached on. So, uh, <laughs> um, years back when someone was criticizing Unitarians, I said, well, here, here's the proof that someone made enough of a note and remembered the sermon. He went back home and wrote down the verse the pe preacher preached on right. twice every Sunday. So, yeah. and Jerome Harris was Yeah, there. yeah, the yeah, because you had, you had the morning the service and the evening yeah. service. Mm -hmm. oh, Okay, thank you, thank Faye. You. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> and we will have refreshments in just a minute or two. They'll be set out. And then in a short time, we will have our business meeting. But everyone is invited to have refreshments with us. Thank you. Can I, can I just say, um, people who don't know, I'm the treasurer, and I'm very happy to get donations, uh, dues, and what's the other thing? And if you buy something here, I get that money too.